Okay, good afternoon and welcome for this uh, policy roundtable, which is sadly again about Ukraine. It's the first after the summer break, and this one is a sort of stock taking after six months of war dedicated to the military, the food security, and the energy and refugee situation. Most welcome to our vice president, uh, to the speakers, to the online audience. Uh, and let us uh, straight ahead uh, start. We have one and a half hour. Uh, Vice President Shkimechka will uh, introduce uh, the issue and uh, make opening remarks. And then I will hand over to Lassebem for the moderation. Um, Vice President Shkimechka has been, has been a member of the European Parliament uh, from uh, Renew and Slovakia since July 2019 and is one of the Vice President of uh, the Parliament since uh, January uh, this year. His responsibilities in the Bureau include democracy and human rights and the Members Research Service and the Library of EPRS. He sits as a member on the Parliament's Committee on Women's Rights and Gender Equality and also as a substitute and rapporteur uh, for the Resilience of Critical Entities Directive on the Committee of Civil Liberties, Justice and Home Affairs. Is also um, the new leader, the new party leader of the Progressive Slovensko. Previously, he was a senior researcher at the Institute of International Relations in Prague, served as an advisor to the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Czech Republic, and worked as a journalist uh, for SME, a Slovak newspaper, and the Financial Times. Vice President, we are very privileged to have you with us today. Uh, you spoke at our latest event uh, before summer on, on Ukraine, and uh, we are very happy to hand uh, you over the floor to uh, make your uh, keynote remarks. Over to you. Thanks. Thank you so much, Etienne. It's always, uh, it's always a pleasure to, uh, to be here with you at, um, um, at EPRS events. And uh, yes, the topic is, as you said, it's grim and it's unfortunate that we, again, um, have, to, have to discuss and debate to the war in Ukraine. But uh, as I think it's clear to everyone, um, it's, it's absolutely necessary. And also the way this, this roundtable is framed is, I, I think, a very good one to take stock after six months uh, of what happened and what it means for the European Union um, going forward. Now, we all, what we all see is that it is indeed um, has become a, a, an absolutely brutal war with, with war crimes, with atrocities that were unimaginable um, in, in Europe just a few months ago. Uh, and it's not just waged on the front itself, but it's also waged against civilians uh, suffering from, from airstrikes, from artillery, from, from, from all sorts of atrocities committed by, um, by, by the Russians. And what we also know after six months, that this is not going to end swiftly, unfortunately. This is not a short-term conflict, uh, partly because the Ukrainian, Ukrainian forces have fought bravely and ably and, has, and, and have resisted the early, the early onslaught by the, by, by the Russian army and the early attempt to, to take over the capital and decapitate the government. So what we now have is, is, is a prolonged struggle, of course, with, uh, with the new counteroffensive in the last couple of days, but it's most likely to be a prolonged struggle in the, um, in the Donbass and in the, in the south of the country. And what we also know is that it's, um, the, the conflict is, goes beyond the battlefield in Ukraine. It's, it's, uh, it's also a larger, one can say, you know, civilizational, especially for the Russians, um, unfortunately, ideological and systemic conflict with um, with with Ukraine, but also but also the larger West and the European Union, um, and um, as such, we also need to 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 perhaps to shift our paradigm and and to think of this as a um, uh, as a prolonged and, and 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 broader conflict, and to find systemic answers on how to how to confront this challenge posed posed by Putin and and and, and by the and by the Russians. So what? So what it means, and what we've seen, and what I, I hope that, uh, that this, this panel, this roundtable, can help illuminate, is that not only does the war affect here in Europe almost every walk of life, almost every policy area, from from defence to to energy to food to to prices to, um, to trade. Um, what what we want to do today, and and what we need to do as as, as European Union, is is to, is to think carefully how. Um, uh, what, what the effects are and well, how do we address them, but also um, what, how, do they, how do they interact. So in this, in this discussion, which I'm very thankful uh, to, to the EPR, EPRS for, for organizing, we're going to be, uh, or rather the experts are going to be 
um, discussing four themes um, and four dimensions uh, of this of this conflict and the way they affect us uh, in the European Union and generally the European continent. There is, of course, the military and security dimension. There is, of course, energy policy, extremely topical um, today and going forward. That is migration and it is food security. And as I've said, also, we would like um, to hear from, from, from the experts to discuss how these different um, dimensions and their effects interact. And what are these linkages? So also our responses are, 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 are systemic and in, 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 in are sustainable in the long run. So taking stock of the um, of the past six six months is, um, is is necessary, but of course it cannot stop there. We cannot just be an, analyzing and reanalyzing what, what has happened. We need to uh, we need to learn from from what happened, what our reactions were um, uh, to the crisis in these various dimensions, and then uh, and then think about how we can adjust our policies in the EU going forward and. Although I understand that in my country, in Slovakia, but elsewhere, the attention um, of, of the political elite and of the citizens is rightly on you know, inflation and rising energy prices and the energy crunch uh, as such. But I, I think given that it's all intertwined with, with, with the war, uh, I, I still would think that uh, the war in Ukraine and our response to it, both in terms of how to support Ukraine, but also in terms of how to adapt to it, does require all absolutely full attention and also full attention of, of the EU's institutions and EU's leaders. I could say that our parliament, the European Parliament, has been a role model in this, uh, in, its, in its rapid and thorough and consistent support for Ukraine from the very start, be it when it comes to financial support or political support for its, um, for, for its integration into the European Union. Um, and what we now hope to achieve with in, in the next one and one, an hour and, and less than 30 minutes now is to is to is to is to have a look and, and reflect upon what worked and, and what did not work and how can we um, how could we address the situation better? Um, I do apologize that I will not be able to 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 be here with you for the entire event, uh, but thanks again for for the invitation. Thanks to um, uh, to to the speakers and um, I, I really hope and and wish you all the best for for a product, very productive roundtable. So thanks so much, Etienne, and back to you. Thank you very much, uh, Michal, for your uh, introduction where you have set the scene so effectively and also uh, you highlighted the role of the parliament in uh, support uh, to Ukraine, which is, I think, absolutely critical. Um, and thank you also for, for, for the words about the EPRS, for the nice words about the EPRS. So uh, let's move now to uh, our discussion and I will just uh, hand the button over to Lars Böhm, who is the head of our Economic Policies Unit. Under Economic Policies Unit, we have all also energy, uh, scientific policies, industry, I mean, all uh, many issues that are actually uh, concerned with this uh, situation. So, uh, last over to you for the moderation and the presentation of uh, the welcoming of our experts. Thank you, Etienne, and a warm welcome to the audience uh, from my side. I have the pleasure to be your moderator. For those of you who are familiar with our format, because of course this is part of a longer series that EPRS is running, uh, we will have uh, four presentations consecutively uh, and then a longer uh, Q&A section uh, at the end. And I warmly invite all attendees to put their questions into the Q&A. I will then try and group them uh, according to topic uh, slash speaker. Um, and I hope we have a, a, a good discussion going as is good practice and uh, tradition here in EPRS. Um, I'm happy to have uh, four speakers here uh, on the panel today. We go um, in the following order. We have Susanna Angel, who might be known to some of you. She's an in-house policy analyst in EPRS, who will speak about the military, security and defence situation. That's the obvious starting point, given that it's a war. Uh, so she will be the first speaker before uh, uh, giving the microphone to Cecilia Freclay, Deputy Head Asylum Unit in the European Commission's Directorate General for Migration and Home Affairs. Cecilia, a warm welcome to you. I'm glad you took time out to join uh, us and brief us about the refugee and migration situation, which has been uh, a topic not only in the news, but is, of course, in uh, a lot of people's minds, especially in those countries most affected. And indeed, we see a lot of refugees from Ukraine uh, also here in Brussels. Cecilia, thank you. Uh, after Cecilia, we will have uh, Philipp Jäger, uh, who is connected uh, to us from Berlin, from the uh, Jacques Delors Centre. 
uh, Philip is a policy fellow for European climate and economic policy, which makes for a nice match because we will be talking about uh, energy, uh, but also the environment fit for 55 and maybe economic policy. We will see uh, how much time we find, but I think it's a very, very pertinent and timely topic uh, to discuss. Thank you, Philip. And finally, we have Anna Caprida, who will speak about food security. Anna is also um, a well-known uh, name, um, if, I, if I may say, as a policy analyst from EPRS. Uh, thank you to all of you, and I give the floor directly to um, Susanna. The floor is yours. Thank you, Lasse, for giving me the floor. Good afternoon to our audience. Uh, six months, as you have rightfully uh, pointed, elapsed since the outbreak of the war. A word the European Council condemned from the very first day, stressing it was unprovoked and unjustified. It is clear by now, as uh, Vice President Szymewska has mentioned, that the war will be long. At this moment in time, uh, we can't speak of the conditions for meaningful peace negotiations. So it is as important, uh, as you said, to take stock of the situation. Uh, I will focus in my intervention on three points, the military situation on the ground, military aid granted thus far to Ukraine, and also consider what we could expect um, in the autumn and the winter, touch upon those systemic answers that um, Vice President Szymewska has mentioned. So, to the first point that I outlined, when it comes to the military situation on the ground, during the summer we saw um, Ukraine change its strategy, move from a, defense, a defensive posture and start a counter-offensive. Uh, rather than capturing large parts of territory at this time in point, the main objective is to disrupt Russian command and control, cut ne necessary supplies, disrupt logistics, uh, hence a number of tactical strikes that we have observed during the summer, including in uh, the illegally occupied uh, Crimea. Uh, these precision strikes are likely to continue, uh, and we can also uh, identify uh, some results. So, there is some progress in the south uh, and in the east, but most important, I think that there is pressure put on the Russians at this moment uh, in time. Uh, pressure, particularly if we see uh, and we look at the Kherson region and oblast, um, the Rush, this pressure has made the Russians postponed, uh, uh, postpone their plans to organize a referendum. And from 2014, once again, experience with Crimea, we see that the referendum was first move, first move into annexing a territory. Um, a problem of concern uh, during this summer uh, and still with us uh, is the situation at the Zaporozhia power plant. The International uh, Atomic Energy Agency has issued yesterday a report um, and it has outlined the, the importance of establishing a nuclear safety and security uh, protection zone around the plant. And this is where uh, international debate and the international community and the UN is going to, 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 to have some uh, discussion and some work to do. So in a nutshell, this is uh, the situation on, on the ground. And I would move now to my second point that I have outlined, um, military aid granted so far to Ukraine. Um, the US is by far the largest donor. If we uh, look at uh, what the Keele Institute for World Economy is putting forward in terms of figures, there are 25 billion euros which have been pledged by the US. Uh, the UK comes in second with 4 billion euros, and the top five is completed by Poland, Germany, and Canada. Now, if we look at the same figures, but from a GDP perspective in terms of ratio of GDP, the situation is different as we see the top five uh, being reached by the Baltics, whilst Poland is keeping its third ranking position. The EU, you might ask yourselves where the EU stands in all this, uh, the EU has pledged 2.5 billion euros under the European Peace Facility, which is an off-budget instrument, uh, meaning it is funded by the member states collectively. Um, and there are several coordination for us uh, where military aid to Ukraine is coordinated, and this includes the Ukraine Contact Group, which is a US-led 
um, and comprises over 40 countries um, and ensures to a certain extent what we would basically consider a demand and supply um, exercise. Basically, the Ukrainians put forward their demands and then there is a response from the different uh, donors. Um, now, if we look at what can uh, be ahead of us in the months to come, um, the cold season is going progressively uh, to come, uh, which means that um, the military activities are going to a certain extent to, to, to reduce. But on the other hand, the precise strikes I was speaking about earlier would continue. I would consider that this might be continuing. Um, but what we uh, would see would be uh, an option for the Ukrainians also to uh, continue their training, to train their armed forces. And it would be a period for the Russians on the other side to try to uh, refill their stocks. And this is where they will have a problem because this is where the sanctions uh, are going to come into play as they might face some problems in uh, acquiring uh, semiconductors or other components which are crucial for high tech weapons. Uh, and this is where this is what would bring could bring them to uh, some unorthodox ways of getting those components. From the EU perspective, uh, there is an important moment in allowing uh, us to uh, come forward with these systemic answers that President Sumexa has has mentioned in the area of defense, in the area of of, of energy. Um, as far as defense uh, is concerned, the debate will be on, on, on joint procurement, but as far as energy, that would be, I see, uh, the, main, the main debate of the autumn without willing to impede on other panelists' um, um, areas. So I will leave it at this for the moment, and I will be happy to take questions. Thank you, Susanna, for giving us this sort of broad overview, I think, which is necessary to put things into perspective while we move into autumn uh, and winter and for also making this link, of course, to energy. But before we get the, to energy and climate and the economy, uh, the floor is uh, to Cecilia. Many thanks, Lars, uh, for giving me the floor and a good afternoon to all and also many thanks for the invitation to participate at, at, these, uh, at these events. Um, I think uh, looking back at what the previous speaker said, uh, putting um, the, 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 the issues into the wider perspective is, is increasingly important. It's also something we have been doing as from the beginning uh, when we looked, of course, from our policy angle, which is uh, asylum and, uh, and migration. Um, I just want to, uh, to give you a couple of, of, of figures and then move to a couple of uh, issues which are important for the next uh, months uh, to come. Uh, just this morning, uh, we learned that uh, the outcome of the newest Eurobarometer is very promising. Uh, on the issue of uh, the Ukraine, uh, our citizens support the EU's policy and uh, no doubt also the role of the Parliament has been crucial in this, uh, in this respect. Um, and as a result also of uh, that, uh, of our policies, there is an increased uh, belief in our citizens that the EU is the right place to handle all these, uh, these matters. Now, what are we talking about in terms of how many people we uh, are hosting at this moment under temporary protection? We're talking about some more some 4.1 million persons which are uh, on our territory for the time being. Um, we do not know um, whether this figure will uh, get uh, more important when we go towards winter. Uh, we have started, of course, our monitoring to see uh, what may uh, lie ahead. And we have uh, been reaching out uh, to our member states also to make sure that they are working hard on contingency planning, including trying to uh, have uh, clearer data on how many people may come to the Union in addition to those who are already hosted uh, by us. Um, what is important is also is that we have been working with our member states to make sure that uh, those who get the benefits indeed uh, get them on, on, in a timely manner. But we also want to avoid that people uh, benefit from, uh, let's say, more than one member state because that is not the, um, uh, the, the, the goal of, of the temporary protection either. So we had to set up in a, a short amount of time, I think we had six weeks, 
a, a kind of platform which allows the member states to compare uh, data and um, out of the let's say 4 million people that benefit they have now for the time being identified some 175 175,000 uh, persons who seem to uh, have a double registration uh, so this platform is is working uh, well it's up to speed now but also the number shows that the number of double registration is not that very uh, that very high one of the strands where we want to continue working also and where we have been doing a lot of work and i think that in the the chat you will see a couple of links uh, to uh, the information websites which we have uh, developed over time it's very important that uh, the persons concerned are informed to the to the fullest extent so that they understand what their rights are that they understand what to do and uh, we continue to make sure that uh, this information is updated and also that it includes uh, all the relevant national links because uh, this is not only the European Union this is also very much our member states uh, it is important to to also understand that um, we have been able to reach at least two million of the beneficiaries through our uh, communication campaign on social media channels. So that also shows that over time this has started to work. Uh, I've been saying that we may expect some more people coming to the European Union uh, as uh, winter is approaching. At the same time, we do observe that uh, there is an increasing trend of uh, persons wanting to go back to Ukraine. Now, going back to Ukraine, we have to understand that this may mean that in some cases people go back and forth, for example, to visit a family or to get uh, uh, papers or to, uh, to check on, uh, on relatives, for example, or they may go back on a more permanent basis because I think that part of the country is still, uh, is still uh, safe enough. Um, we will intensify our efforts to monitor this, to understand what is going on, whether indeed people want to only go back for a short period or whether they think they can move back more permanently. If you travel back for only a short amount of time, you will not lose your benefits under the Temporary Protection Directive because this is considered not as a, a, a long-term return to, uh, to Ukraine. And also in this, in this situation, it is important that people are well informed about what may be the consequences if they go back on a more permanent basis, because when you go back permanently, you will no longer benefit from temporary uh, protection. Um, what is uh, another issue which has been raised also in our context with, uh, with the Parliament and where we have started our work over the summer is the implementation of the Temporary Protection Directive. What are the member states doing? How are they doing it? Uh, is it working in the way we would like it to see working? And um, our first assessment of what we have been seeing, we have been analysing uh, the instruments which the, the member states send to us and also based on our own uh, groundwork. Um, and I have to say 26 member states, because as you may know, Denmark is not bound by the Temporary Protection Directive. The overall assessment is that generally the implementation is in conformity with our rules, with our acquis, but as always, further work needs to be done. And you will not be uh, surprised that one of these issues is uh, accommodation. Accommodation is a key issue and it will continue to remain a key issue, not in the least uh, because um, we will probably see people coming from Ukraine who are currently displaced within the country and who may not be living in uh, facilities which are sufficiently winterized and who may then decide to come to the, to the Union. One of the issues we are currently working with, and uh, those are our colleagues of, uh, of DG ECHO, I have to say, it's about winterization of uh, the facilities, the units which already have been provided to Ukraine, for example, so to make sure that the shelter is uh, more fit for, uh, for purpose. What is also important is that we have noticed that uh, at least 17 member states have been a bit more generous. They uh, have extended the scope of uh, the Council implementing decision. For example, they have also allowed uh, people under temporary protection 
who were already in the European Union before the date of the invasion, before the date of 24th of February. So that is, of course, a very positive sign. And of course, we are grateful for that kind of, of, of generosity. Other issues which are important and which also will continue to uh, take a lot of our attention and time together with the member states, but also our agencies and UNCHR and IOM um, are issues like um, education and, uh, and health care. Now, on this two topics, the situation seems to be rather good under control. Um, the member states have already uh, hosted and will continue to host half a million children in uh, our schooling system. And that was important for us to, to, to understand if that would work well, because of course now in September, kids are going back to school. And it is important that certainly uh, this, this younger generation does not, uh, uh, will not be left out of, uh, of important uh, uh, schooling. Coming a bit back to accommodation, um, what we are also doing is uh, we try to support the member states financially in this area. And we uh, think that um, in the near future, we still will continue to count also on private housing. And that will continue to stay a very important element in the way we accommodate uh, the, uh, the refugees. Um, our contingency planning, I already said a, a little bit, uh, we are preparing for winter uh, in terms of looking at notably the housing and also uh, other, other conditions, both in the EU, but also outside the EU, notably in, of course, uh, uh, some parts of Ukraine where we can have access and also in Moldova. Um, in terms of um, how we see this uh, developing over time, uh, our legal instruments, and notably the Temporary Protection Directive, gives us a bit of time. Uh, we can, if we don't do anything, we can extend uh, the temporary protection for six months after the 4th of March 2023, and for again another six months, uh, so until the 4th of March 2024. So that gives us a bit of time uh, to make sure uh, that we can uh, continue to accommodate those who are in need of, of temporary protection, whilst also seeing uh, what kind of measures we need to uh, continue to make in terms of um, uh, assisting the country in um, well in, in getting through this extremely uh, difficult uh, period. What I uh, want. What I find myself rather heartening, and I want to conclude with, with this, is that, that our citizens, uh, despite the fact of rising prices in general, but also rising energy prices, have told us, as I said at the beginning, that they continue to support Ukraine, that they continue to support our humanitarian approach, and that they continue to support, that we continue to take on people within the EU. I think that is a very positive message from our citizens for which we are very grateful. Last, that's it for the time being. Cecilia, thank you so much. And um, I think it was, I'm particularly grateful um, for the fact that you gave some figures. Uh, so I, I noted down 4.1 million Ukrainians um, on the territory of the EU uh, currently. So I think that's a, that's a, an interesting figure to to bear in mind i'm also grateful that you sort of disaggregated this entire topic a little bit you pointed towards winter the need to uh, winterize uh, facilities uh, schooling accommodation will remain an issue uh, in some member states especially densely populated areas um, even in brussels uh, but uh, perhaps more so uh, even in uh, member states which have taken on um, a large share of uh, uh, refugees maybe we come back to this uh, question uh, later, and you also pointed uh, towards the need for EU support. So I think this might be something to reflect on. And finally, of course, you gave an interesting date, which might uh, 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 ring a bell with some of our listeners. You said the temporary protection directive uh, can be prolonged until March 2024. Uh, so I think our listeners might find this date quite interesting, if you allow. But we will come back to this uh, in the Q&A and the, and the discussion, I'm fairly sure. Um, Let's move on uh, first, though, to Philip, who uh, sits in the eye of the storm uh, in, 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 in many respects, um, at least in two respects, because uh, he is uh, researching uh, European uh, environmental energy and economic policy at the Jacques Delors Centre in Berlin. 
So uh, he is exactly looking into the energy policy uh, that was already mentioned by Susanna. But of course, you are also based in Berlin, which uh, finds itself uh, in many ways in the eye of the storm of a possible shortfall of um, electricity and gas this winter, uh, and therefore also plays a crucial role policy wise. Uh, Philip has the advantage of having worked in Brussels before uh, you worked uh, in the European Commission uh, on the uh, recovery and resilience facility and have uh, sadly uh, left Brussels, uh, moved to Berlin. Uh, but um, we're very glad that we have you as a speaker. So, Philip, the floor is yours. Uh, many thanks, Nasa, for the kind introduction. Um, unfortunately, uh, this claim at the beginning, um, I have to apologize for my voice. I caught COVID, and so I, I hope with uh, sufficient water I get through the, the, uh, the talk. Um, and uh, as Nasa mentioned, of course, the, the topic at the moment is very fast paced with lots of developments, including in this week, actually. Um, and so I thought to help myself out a little bit, I would uh, present a few slides just to make it easier to give an overview. Um, do you now see just the presentation? Okay, perfect. Um, okay, I have the pleasure to talk about the EU energy situation. Um, and I think it makes sense to recall that uh, energy prices were already high before the beginning of the war. Um, and yeah, after the, the pandemic, supply uh, was much lower than demand, uh, and hence prices uh, uh, went up. Um, with the beginning of the war, the dependency when it comes to energy of uh, the European Union on Russia became very evident. And just to uh, give you one important figure, um, last year, still 40% of uh, total gas imports to the EU came from Russia. Um, and by now, Russia has reduced, or we have, uh, to a certain extent, also Europe has reduced its imports uh, from Russia. And now it's only a fifth uh, last week of the flows uh, that came in uh, a year ago in the same week. Um, when it comes to gas storage levels, uh, Europe is on a relatively good trajectory. And uh, levels are at 80%, but I think here it's important to keep in mind that uh, even if the uh, storage was completely full, this would not get us through the winter without uh, demand reduction and increased inflows uh, from other supply mm, supplying nations. Um, and just to put the price increase, which is always talked about a little bit into perspective, um, last year in September, the price was already much higher than in the months before. As I said, because of uh, the energy shortage following the pandemic, um, it was at 30 euros. Now it's uh, fluctuating quite a bit and there's a lot of volatility. But last time I checked, it was, uh, I think, at 210 euros. Uh, but a few weeks ago, it was uh, uh, about 300 euros. Uh, so staggering increases. Um, and I think it's important to keep this in mind that this is different from other price increases we've seen uh, before. Contrasting the enormous price increase uh, with the demand decrease. Demand hasn't gone down as much as uh, one might have hoped or would have expected given uh, the increases indicating a relatively low uh, price elasticity. And so in the first six months, it only went down by 7%. And um, as Lasse mentioned at the beginning, of course, uh, Germany, for instance, is uh, particularly hard hit by the situation. And so the, the impacts across the EU is very heterogeneous. Okay. Moving from the gas situation to the electricity situation. Um, first, we mostly just had a, a gas crisis, but now given that uh, a lot of gas is burned to generate electricity, we also see rising electricity prices. But I think here it's important to keep in mind that the high gas prices are not the only factor this summer and probably also going forward why electricity prices are high. Um, most of you already know this, uh, but in case uh, uh, you didn't pay too much attention to the news cycle during the summer break, uh, I thought I'd uh, bring this up again. Um, so, of course, there, were the, there are the nuclear power shutdowns in France. To um, some extent, this is also relevant for Germany. Germany just decided yesterday to shut off uh, the uh, remaining nuclear plants. Um, because of the severe droughts, hydropower is uh, running at much lower levels uh, than in previous years. The droughts also cause lower water levels, 
which means it's much more difficult to ship the same levels, the same amounts of coal on the river. Uh, and coal, of course, is also used to generate electricity. Um, and those are probably the, the three main factors. And then one issue that is being discussed, especially in, in this week and on Friday, is the market design of the electricity market, uh, which we can touch upon later. Um, also here, uh, price developments are at a very heterogeneous across the European Union. Um, just to give one example, in Germany, uh, at times, the wholesale price of electricity is 10 times what it was uh, last year. So staggering increases again. Um, household prices, of course, are also rising and they have risen already. But uh, in comparison to the wholesale price trajectory, they're still quite contained in a lot of countries. And of course, this is due to existing contracts. And so people still pay the price that they signed up for a year ago and also because uh, government interventions. Okay, so this is just to uh, give you a big, uh, a quick snapshot of the energy crisis situation. Um, and now we'll go on to the EU uh, the response uh, so far, what the European Union has done. Um, and I hope I'm not taking, taking too much time. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to be snappy. Um, here again, I can only list uh, uh, a few a few things, the most important ones, uh, starting with Repower EU, uh, which was uh, presented uh, last spring or early summer. And uh, as you probably know, the main objectives are to save energy, diversify energy sources, and accelerate the green transition. Those are basically the, the three pillars. And I think when it comes to diversifying energy sources, the European Union has done a relatively good job including some of the member states, such as Germany, when it comes to saving energy and accelerating the green transition, less so. Um, but overall, I think Repower EU is a good plan with one big issue, or some big issues, but the, the biggest one is, uh, in my view, clearly the financing. Um, it has an envelope of 300 billion euros till 2030, of which 210 billion are to be spent by uh, 2027. Um, but this is mostly existing money. Um, the market stability reserve uh, should be uh, is in, proposed by the Commission to be used as a source of fresh money, but there's a lot of opposition to this because it was would uh, question the integrity of the um, emission trading system as a whole. And so there's, there's almost no new money. Um, and I think going forward uh, in the next uh, few weeks and months, where the money comes from for Repower EU will be an important uh, yeah, part of the debate. One slightly overlooked factor, I think, is that Repower EU can also serve as a steering tool of sorts to align the gas prices response of the European Union with climate objectives. And of course, the, the power of the steering tool would increase with additional funding um, to keep that in mind. Then moving on to another big um, yeah, development uh, to the gas savings regulation from July with the 15% reduction target, which for the time being is mandatory, but could become, um, I'm sorry, for the time being is voluntary, but could become mandatory uh, if the council um, decides so based on certain criteria. Um, of course, the, the, the exceptions that are part uh, of the regulation, allowing a lot of uh, countries not to be subject to the target, um, was criticized. But I think a lot of the exceptions make sense because France saving energy or Portugal saving energy doesn't help um, countries that are not very well connected uh, uh, with France. So to a certain extent, the exceptions are justifiable, I think. Two points that I would like to point out when it comes to the gas saving regulation is that so far only very few bilateral solidarity agreements have been struck between countries. Um, so those agreements would, in the case of intense scarcity, be used to determine how neighboring countries uh, can get energy uh, from one country to the other. And so far, uh, not enough of those have been agreed. And Again, this is a, a theme that is prevalent in the whole energy debate. Overall demand reduction measures don't seem enough at the moment. And I think more is needed from governments and from the, uh, from the private sector 
you know, to get uh, demand down before the winter or during the winter. Um, the next point I would like to mention is the national measures that have been enacted. There's a lot of uh, national money being spent on protecting consumers from high energy prices. Uh, Bruegel had a good study that uh, I recommend to check out where they listed uh, those measures. And even just until July, uh, they estimated uh, those measures to amount to 280 billion. And now, um, last week in Germany, uh, introduced another 65 billion uh, uh, package and other countries uh, do that as well. So this number uh, is quite high as well. And here, I think it's important, we can talk about this later, that this is coordinated on a European level. And um, yeah, the upcoming this week, and uh, it's been, been around for a while, are the energy markets uh, interventions, for instance, taxing the inframarginal profits and in electricity markets. But because I think I'm running out of time, I'm not going into these slides, and we'll just talk about uh, what's needed, in my view, uh, on EU level. And when it comes to market interventions, and you know, I think this is particular, particularly relevant uh, this week already, is to maintain the price signals. Um, so, as I said, it will be important to continue to get demand down, and the uh, most, straight, most straightforward lever for this would be to keep prices high. But of course, this only works if the vulnerable households then are supported. And from an economics point of view, the most efficient and most sensible way to do this is uh, with direct transfers. And to a certain extent, this also applies to uh, vulnerable businesses. And now in the, uh, in the recent uh, days, also the risk of a almost systemic collapse, like uh, we saw with Lehman Brothers, for instance, is being debated to what extent this is possible. And here, um, liquidity support for energy firms might be needed and might be needed in, uh, in large amounts. Another thing that I believe is, is, is needed, and probably I'm preaching to the, to the choir here with the European Parliament, is European solidarity. Um, obviously, when it comes to energy and energy being a network good, in many senses, uh, the European solutions are superior. And uh, with, uh, with solutions that are coordinated on a European level, uh, distortions in the single market can be avoided. And we saw some distortions already emerging from the, um, the cushioning measures that were taken on the Iberian Peninsula. Uh, so avoiding distortions, I think, is a, is a good reason to, to try always first for a European solution. Um, so there, I think, is also needed when it comes to infrastructure. Um, we see that now the countries that are well interconnected have it much easier, and there are large gains to be interconnected and establishing this infrastructure. But one issue is that not always the benefit of um, yeah, installing that infrastructure accrues to the state or the, the country uh, that has to bear the cost. And yeah, just to give one example, I think the mid-cap pipeline that is uh, to be installed between Spain and France, um, France is against it, and this, uh, I don't want to get into the technical details, but one reason France might be against it could also be that the uh, gains of installing this pipeline would accrue partially in France, but also a lot in Germany and in other European countries. And so from that point of view, it can make sense to use European money to finance those infrastructures because the value accrues to a lot of uh, European member states. Um, solidarity is also needed for coordination. Um, at the moment, gas storage is going well, but it would make sense to uh, ensure that, for instance, in countries like Austria, where the storage is relatively low at the moment, but we funnel more, uh, we, you know, we give more gas basically to Austria, because Austria is in a location when the winter comes, we can distribute gas. And uh, if we don't strategically fill the, the storages that we have, we might run into binding uh, constraints when it comes to transporting gas. So we might have a lot of uh, gas storage in certain parts of Germany, but then we, we might not be able to get that, uh, the required amounts to other countries. Um, and then one point, uh, I'm one that is close to, to my heart and my work is that uh, 
in the EU response, uh, it's important that the energy measures that are taken now is, uh, in this emergency are as best possible aligned with climate targets. Uh, and I think this is especially important when it comes to avoiding overcapacity of fossil fuel infrastructure. Um, when we, we see national countries building up LNG terminals um, and in a, in a way that's good because it might make this winter and the next winter a lot easier, but we might end up in 2025 or 2030 with a huge overcapacity. And this would be quite detrimental and would have lock in effects. Um, then the second thing in this uh, era that I would like to point out is that, in my view, it's very important to maintain the integrity of climate instruments. I mentioned this earlier with the market stability reserve, but now also um, you know, uh, people are arguing that the ETS system should be put on hold or shouldn't, uh, shouldn't be as binding anymore. And I think this is very dangerous and uh, the climate uh, uh, the climate crisis will will be with us for a long time and we certainly shouldn't sacrifice any of the available instruments we have, such as the ETS, uh, for short-term problems because those short-term problems uh, hopefully can be tackled uh, by adjusting other short-term instruments. Okay. I promised earlier last year that I wouldn't go over time. I, I'm afraid I might have. I hope that's uh, that's fine. Sorry about that. I think that was a, a perfect overview uh, of um, a very complex series of topics, in fact, because you were talking about energy and ended up talking about climate, and we all know they are crucially interlinked and have to, and your argument was that they have to remain interlinked. Um, I took away a figure you gave, or two figures you gave, 15% uh, demand reduction in gas, uh, agreed on by the council in what remains for the time being at least a voluntary measure. Uh, but then you said only 7% demand reduction uh, actually happening uh, over the summer. Uh, seven is significantly lower than 15, if my math uh, serves me right. Uh, so we are certainly not there yet. So I think that's something to discuss in a moment. And I'd also like to come back to the last point you made about aligning energy targets with climate measures in the uh, in the debate, and uh, we're already getting uh, questions on these. Uh, but before we go to the debate, let's go uh, finally, uh, last but not least, to Anna Caprida uh, from EPRS, who uh, does a lot of work on uh, food security. Uh, so it's a grain issue, the, the, the deal or supposed deal, or I'm sure, I hope Anna will tell us uh, whether it is a deal. Uh, between Ukraine and Russia um, and, and, and beyond, in fact, because, of course, it has global implications, or does it? Question to you, Anna. Thank you very much, uh, Lasse, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so, by now, um, six months uh, down the line, um, the words food security, food crisis, and massive starvation have sadly become a part of our daily headlines. Uh, most of us are familiar with the share of Russian exports in the market, Ukrainian exports. Some may even know what potash means. And um, even that uh, together, Russia and Ukraine export 12% of the globally traded calories. We know the facts, and I'm not going to repeat them uh, here. We have several publications, and uh, there are several publications available. What I would like today to spark the discussion is to analyze further and even challenge some of um, some aspects of the of the commonly portrayed narrative about the food crisis. Um, and I will focus on two two points: the the food crisis itself um, and the Black Sea uh, Grain Initiative. And then I will leave you with three points for further reflection. Um, first. Uh, the food crisis did not start in February 2022. One year ago, 2021, um, after a severe climate shocks and the pandemic, a staggering figure of 276 million people were at the risk of starvation. Starvation means you don't know when or what your next meal will be. It's well beyond hunger, it's well beyond malnutrition, is the doorstep of death. 
276 million is half, well, now 60% of the EU population starving. Well, if that, that cannot be defined as a crisis, even if we have assumed its chronic condition, tell me what it is. What yes happened in February 2022 was that in addition to that situation, we faced a severe market shock. This shock was produced by two main factors, the supply shock, the sudden interruption of Ukrainian exports, uncertainty about the next harvest in Ukraine and in Russia at the beginning, um, disruption of supply chains, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then an inflation shock, because the uh, inflationary tensions that were present before were fueled by the by the conflict, um, the, and then as a result, the fuel basic commodity prices and fertilizers prices um, increased uh, to a rocket levels. The reaction in the global markets to this shock was not surprisingly the worst that you can have. Uh, and that despite the, the lessons learned uh, in 2007, 2008, countries resorted to export restrictions um, up to tw 20 countries. Um, adopted some kind of export bans or even total bans, and market operators followed the logic of the market, and by doing so, they made a problem even worse. Um, they acted within legal terms. I mean, what they were doing was legal, but uh, has been labeled as speculation. So what we faced. Um, in um, after the, the war was what IPS food um, rightly uh, defined as the perfect storm. Even if food availability was not at stake globally, because um, uh, the, the, the FAO already announced uh, in June that um, the, the supply shock was, uh, was absorbed and that the level of the stocks was even before was even uh, more than before the war, um, a number of countries and millions of people were at risk of facing hunger because the countries could not afford the food prices. And that was putting the governments in Northern Africa and Middle East in an unbearable financial uh, position. So this is a little bit my challenge uh, to, to, to the first point. The next point, the Black Sea Grain Initiative. Um, no doubt the, si the signature of the Black Sea Grain Initiative in July was received with immense relief and was celebrated by the whole world. Um, first, it was addressing a pressing global uh, risk uh, or global issue, food crisis. Second, and very relevant in my opinion, it was the first meaningful and successful action by the UN since the beginning of the war. And that was very important since the UN had been criticized for its inaction, which we know the, the reasons for that. But third also, it was in somehow the defeat of Vladimir Putin attempt to weaponize food and to use the food security card um, in exchange of relieving Western sanctions. The world showed him that there was another way, another war. And, those, and this is absolutely true. But then it comes my challenge. <laughs> the Black Sea Grain Initiative did not happen in isolation. Already uh, facing the attempt by Russia and by Vladimir Putin to use global hunger uh, hunger as an additional weapon in this hybrid war, the response of the international community was swift and firm. International food security um, uh, initiatives proliferated. We can discuss about their coordination. They were championed by the UN, the, the EU, uh, G7, France. Um, but one in particular, I think, played a big role. The EU launched already in May the EU Solidarity Lanes Initiative. This was an alternative for Ukrainian exports 
um, to be shipped uh, to be to be um, uh, transferred by land and not by sea using um, using land routes through Poland and and, and Romania uh, mainly it was difficult some say it was impossible um, it was cumbersome and it was costly but it but it was an alternative and so far it has contributed to um, um, unblock 8.6 million tons from Ukraine. I, it, emptying Ukrainian silos was one of the objectives of the initiative. I wondered whether if that initiative would have not been um, successful or partly successful, I wonder whether this has not accelerated the, the Black Sea Rain Dale initiative. It's just a question I leave for the for the audience. Um, in in comparison, through the Black Sea uh, Grain Initiative, um, one million metric tons have been exported so far. So it's much less, but it has to pick it up. And the, the big difference is that through the Black Sea Grain Initiative, the containers can reach much quicker, easier, and cheaper the destination ports in Sudan, Egypt, South Korea, Iran, etc., which is not the case with the EU Solidarity Lens Initiative. These were my two points uh, for reflection, and then three very minor points for, for looking uh, forward and the unintended consequences of this food crisis. The first one is that the food crisis is not over. Uh, it was there and it, is, it remains. Um, and until this is not tackled in a systemic way, food and food insecurity will remain a card to use in any possible conflict. Of course, this is the subject of another policy hub, round and forum, but I wanted to leave there. The second, um, a little bit more domestic, is that um, um, the, the common agricultural policy has been vindicated after this crisis. The, the common agricultural policy has emerged like the, the safe port um, that ensure that food um, availability was not at stake in Europe. And subsequently, this may have some consequences for the, the policy because uh, food productivity can be put ahead, food sustainability, and therefore environmental aspects of the new cap can be left a little bit behind. I leave that for the, 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 the reflection. And third, uh, we like it or not, Russia has emerged as an agricultural powerhouse, even more so after this war. Already between 2000 and 2018, the exports of Russia uh, were um, increased by 16 times. And today, Russia is the third producer of wheat uh, only after China and India. It has over, overpassed uh, the United States. Climate change apparently even um, plays in favor of uh, some aspects of uh, Russian uh, agricultural production in the short term, of course. So this is a factor that maybe I would like to leave there on the table for discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anna, uh, for, I'm not sure what it was, a sobering, uh, realistic, but also in part, I think, uplifting analysis by pointing towards the importance of the cap. I think that is very important. And the EU green lanes, uh, which we don't hear enough about, uh, everyone is concentrating uh, on, on the ships, uh, myself included, when we had a, a, our prep talk. Um, and I came back to the ships and you pointed out the green lanes to me, since it's not my policy area. Um, and thank you for reminding us uh, about an ongoing uh, uh, global crisis, uh, slow burning and outside uh, the media spotlight. 266, 266 million uh, people starving uh, was the figure you used, uh, if, I, if I cite you uh, correctly. I think we'll come back to this, but what I suggest uh, since it's 2.30 and you are exactly on time, uh, within 30 seconds, uh, 
which gives us uh, 30 minutes of discussion. And I've got uh, questions uh, flowing in via the chat, direct message, and my email inbox. Um, I've got two questions which are a little bit outside the scope of this um, discussion, but I will just read it to uh, all panelists uh, in case you would like to contribute to them. Don't feel obliged because um, they're not, strictly speaking, covered uh, by this panel. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, I want you to make uh, uh, I want you to I want to make you aware of them. The first one is a question. Uh, I will just read it uh, to you. Thank you for the presentations. Uh, it's clear that all themes here are interlinked. They are influencing one another. And now comes the question: To what extent do you see interaction between committees, experts, etc., and the use of systems thinking in the process of building solutions? So it's about the interactions of the four themes and how to tackle them policy wise. And I just put them because it's not a specific question to any one of you, uh, maybe to all of you in case you would like to come to this question. There is a second question, which is about sanctions. Now we don't have anyone uh, on sanctions on the panel. Uh, so uh, I, I am afraid it's outside the scope, but if one of you would like to answer it, uh, the question is how much those countries can inhibit effective EU support to Ukraine and the maintenance of sanctions. Now, I presume this question will not be answered um, because it's a very technical and uh, uh, legally complex one, but um, I also use the occasion to point to the possibility for members to ask EPRS, of course, if you have uh, any question uh, related to sanctions. And we also published, for example, a timeline um, on sanctions, knowing that EPRS, of course, within its mandate cannot give legal advice. So that was my little promotional bit. Uh, but now uh, to the very first question, uh, which was uh, asked by uh, Piotr uh, Senator. Um, uh, oh, so Cecilia, uh, so you have your hand raised. Would you like to come in on this point before we go on? Yes, yes, very briefly, Lars, uh, because I think uh, that the issue raised by Piotr is, uh, is uh, uh, crucial. Uh, I haven't mentioned anything about coordination because um, you can fill one hour or even more uh, with it, uh, but it can also be rather boring. But uh, to say that uh, coordination has been key of uh, what we have been doing as from the beginning as European Commission, and you have to understand that as coordination with the member states, with the agencies, with UNCHR and IOM, meaning that we have, uh, I think, on average every week, uh, three to four meetings. Um, that can be horizontal, that can also be on, on specific uh, topics. The one we had this morning was in fact on winterization. Um, and uh, we bombard the poor member states with questionnaires of all kinds of issues, but we also have a constant reaching out to other departments like not only DG ECHO, but also Sante because of the health issues, uh, to our colleagues of, uh, of FISMA because of our financial issues with bank accounts, and I can continue like that. That coordination, it took a bit of time to build up, but it has been built up within the Commission, within the Member States, with the Member States, and also with third countries. Uh, and that is something which is not visible, and it should not be visible. The results should be visible. Uh, but this, uh, this, this has been uh, built up in, in, in a quite a short amount of time. And um, uh, as I said, it requires a continuous um, uh, dialogue with the member states also to identify what is the most typical issue, topical issue for the moment. I mentioned already a number of them, but it has become our, our daily business between 9 and 11 every morning. Don't bother us. We are in coordination meetings. <laughs> no, I think that's important to point out. And in fact, the picture has been surprisingly smooth, at least from the outside. Um, uh, and it's important to, to say that um, this was not a given. Uh, this was not a given at any moment and is the result of hard work. Uh, indeed, so we go um, to the very first question, which was uh, uh, put to us in the chat. Let me just uh, find it here. I think it goes to Susanna, uh, who spoke uh, as first speaker on uh, security and defense, and it's about uh, the donors of military aid. Uh, no Italy, no France, no Spain was mentioned in absolute values, not in percentage of GDP. Estonia committed more than 21 other member states. Does that not demonstrate that there is no significant support from the EU to the Ukrainian war effort. Now, um, I'm not entirely sure whether that 
demonstrated there's no significant support because I think various member states donated various things uh, and helped out and coordinated on various fronts, not all of the military, but maybe I'm sort of pre sort of preempting the answer that, that Susanna might want to give. Uh, Susanna, floor is yours. I'll, I'll leave this to you. Thank you, Lasse. I think that there are several elements uh, in, in that question. So first, when it comes to military aid and, and the EU, I have mentioned the 2.5 billion euros um, given via the European Peace Facility. And that amount uh, is basically member states funding as the European Peace Facility is an off budget instrument. Uh, and it's a sizable amount in the sense that the entire instrument uh, uh, has an envelope of 5.6 billion up to 2027. So 2.5 have been already pledged for Ukraine. So that I think in itself speaks for, uh, for the EU commitment. But I think that if we speak about the EU commitment as such in terms of, of assistance, uh, one has to look at different other um, assistance lines from humanitarian aid, to, to the macro financial assistance. So all that has to be taken into, into consideration, plus support to frontline countries. Um, all that has to be considered. Now, there is another element of the question which attacks individual member states and their uh, uh, bilateral uh, support to, to Ukraine. Um, some of the member states have considered that they are not going to, to disclose everything that they offer to Ukraine. It is also the case for some of the Eastern European countries. Uh, and uh, the Kili Institute in its methodology is uh, clearly uh, outlining the fact that their calculation and their data is based on uh, the publicly available um, amounts or, or what can be quantified in terms of uh, equipment given to Ukraine. And if we granulate it even more as a question and we go to individual member states and we take the example of France, uh, we see that actually France has been uh, donating uh, one of the key um, weapons that uh, is enabling currently uh, the Ukrainians to do their counteroffensive. Uh, meaning the Cesar self-propelled howitzer. Uh, it's one of the three uh, such uh, uh, elements with HIMARS, HIMARS of the Americans and the uh, Panzer Haubitze uh, 5000 uh, of the Germans. So I think that uh, it is very difficult to consider that uh, uh, there is no support to the Ukrainian war effort. I will stop here. Well, thanks for pointing out the sort of quality element here uh, beyond the, the 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 mere quantity. Can I can I add a question, um, which which also came in from the sides? It's about the role of the EU more specifically. Um, there has been talk about a training mission, uh, and and this, uh, to my knowledge at least, um, didn't really sort of take off. Uh, do you have any thoughts on this? Uh, is this needed? Is there a scope? Is there a role for the EU? Do we have a budget? Does it even make sense? Does it not make sense? Do, do you have any view on the idea to um, ask the, or endow the EU level uh, to establish a, a training mission for, and that's the, the second question maybe, for whom? Now, the Ukrainian military or police or, 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 or civil protection forces or uh, maybe just you just have some some views uh, on uh, what this discussion means uh, or and could lead to in the in the in the upcoming months. Well, yes, you're right. There has been discussion about uh, a training mission, or possibly a training mission that the EU would put uh, uh, forward in the fall. Uh, this discussion occurred at the last Gimnich uh, last week of of August. The Gimnich is an informal. Uh, format where ministers come and discuss. So a decision uh, would be expected by uh, October at the formal council. And in the meantime, um, the external action service is, is working on the different uh, options and a possible mandate. And the, there, what you have hinted at is interesting. What could be the mandate of, of this of this of this mission? There are a number of, of things that uh, Europeans can do together. 
the mining is one of the things. Uh, we already see that the Germans and the Dutch have announced that they are going to train the Ukrainian uh, armed forces uh, on the mining, and that is something that can be uh, made uh, part of a mandate of a future training mission because there are other member states who have expertise and there are also third uh, countries which normally uh, from time to time contribute to CSDP uh, missions which could be interested and have the expertise in, in the mining. Um, other kind of, of support could be also in terms of um, military uh, hospitals uh, and uh, health support uh, so there is a scope for a training uh, mission uh, that the EU could uh, could uh, put together, definitely. I think there's plenty of uh, topics for Seda and Afet um, to discuss them. So thanks, uh, Susanna, for, for for delving a little bit into into more detail of uh, what I'm sure will be discussed in those two committees um, and beyond. By the way, uh, not just these two these two committees. Uh, can I can I move to uh, Cecilia with uh, questions uh, that I got uh, on? Um, can you, uh, Cecilia? We're now with you, the question of Ukrainian refugees, of course. Do you have any figures uh, or sort of at least broad sketches, in case you uh, don't, um, about secondary movements, meaning uh, you, you, refugees from Ukraine uh, first registering in one member state and then moving on, and uh, whether that moving on is permanent uh, or not. Can you give us any sense? Can you give us any sense of which member states have received most uh, refugees on a, as far as we can see, at least permanent basis for the time being, of course, knowing that you, you alluded to the fact that uh, Ukrainians are also coming, going back, which is an interesting uh, development um, to watch. Uh, and connected to that, um, I thought it was very interesting you pointed uh, towards the need to winterize, um, I use your term, uh, facilities. Is the EU equipped uh, financially to help member states here? Uh, do we need to help member states here? Is this a discussion already? Um, again, it's not, it's not my policy area, so you pardon me if uh, uh, if that's not an adequate question, but it's an, a question which actually came to me uh, listening to you, um, Cecilia, please. No, thanks, so much. thanks a lot, Lars. I think these are these are very very relevant questions on who which member state hosts most of the the persons. It depends which benchmark you take. Uh, we we look at different benchmark. You can look at the uh, percentage of population. Then I think on the top of my head it is Estonia. Uh, but when you look at the absolute numbers, it's Poland. Uh, when you look at the number of GDP there, I have to say uh, I don't have that on the top of my mind. So it depends a bit from which angle you look at it. But um, linking that also to financial support, uh, most of the financial support still goes to what we call the frontline member states. So the Czech Republic, uh, the, uh, Poland, uh, Slovakia, uh, Hungary, but also to some extent now also to Latvia, uh, Lithuania and, and Estonia, because uh, they also uh, receive increasingly uh, people from uh, from uh, Ukraine. Um, and can we can we continue? Well, for the time being, I think we seem to manage. Uh, financially, of course, with, with the support of the Parliament, we could very quickly adopt uh, legislation to make sure that we all did it in, in the right way, because one of the questions which was uh, emerging, uh, when at some point in time the Member States are audited for the money they received, um, how are we going to handle that? Because this is all an emergency situation. Uh, so we had to look for what simpler ways to do that, but it also required amending our instruments. And with the help of the Parliament, we managed that very quickly. Um, in terms of movements, well, um, I, 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 I tend not to qualify them as secondary movements because secondary movements has the connotation of people who should not move to another member state because they should wait for the uh, decision on their asylum application in the member state where they launched it. And uh, the difference between, uh, let's say, uh, the asylum system as we know it in our member states based on the EU law and uh, the temporary protection and also the fact that the Ukraine um, citizens, at least the vast majority, um, have could uh, enjoy vis-a-vis -vis travel based on their uh, electronic passports, meant that they, within 90 days, they could move on 
from one member state to the other. This has happened to some extent. Uh, I think uh, quite some people who first ended up in, in, in the frontline member states moved then to, um, uh, to Germany in the first instance, mainly also to uh, bigger cities. And that brings me a bit back also to the accommodation issue where I think our big cities are overwhelmed. And we are even discussing with the member states whether people should not be moved more to the countryside. Um, but what is uh, what is important to note that uh, still um, uh, there is a tendency with quite some of the refugees to stay close to the border with Ukraine, uh, allowing them to go back as soon as they think they can. Of course, that that wish was maybe in their view more realistic in the first months. Now, of course, maybe that 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 per perception may change. Uh, but there are still quite some people who I think have the aspiration to go back, which also I think explains why we are seeing these uh, movements uh, back to uh, to uh, Ukraine. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we have this registration platform, which allows us to see whether there are double registrations, which as such is not illegal. It simply means that then the member states have to discuss amongst themselves and that the one where the registration takes place, the last should take on the person and should uh, take care of temporary protection for that person. But as I said, we want to avoid that people get a, a double, uh, double allocations. But there is, a, a, let's say, an, um, an element of free travel. Uh, uh, because they 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 have the uh, the visa free travel for 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 90 days. Um, the moment they get a residence permit, they can uh, visit other member states like we can do as as European uh, citizens. But we don't have data uh, saying that many uh, moved uh, uh, within a certain period to to that given a uh, member state. We have some data, but I don't think they uh, are necessarily very reliable um, because what we measure are movements and not persons. Um, so when you, and th that's also the same for, the, for, for those who go back, we don't, we don't have an entry exit system yet in the EU. We, the, the, the legislation is there, the member states are busy implementing, but there are some delays. And until we have that, um, we just measure the number of movements. But if you travel back and forward, you may count the, self, the same person a number of times. So uh, there is here a challenge, I would say, of data accuracy of which we are aware. Uh, and that's why we also uh, uh, asked member states to make sure there are as many registrations because those are persons we register. But uh, on, on, on the data quality, that is still uh, an issue to be met, I would say. Thank you for clarifying these. Um... Uh, these facts and different data, because we, of course, we do receive a lot of questions from our members uh, on on the data, and I think there's a lot of confusion uh, over that. So, uh, but while you spoke, I received another question uh, from Michaela Del Monte from EPRS uh, on the 17 member states you mentioned, which went beyond the temporary uh, protection directive. Can you give some examples uh, of what going beyond the uh, TPD framework uh, means? Uh, are these all roughly by and large, doing the same thing, or is there kind of distinguish different groups? Uh, can you can you say uh, any more on this? In I would say about one or two minutes, because we then move on to yeah. to Philip uh, and uh, Anna before closing at three. Most of them have uh, extended uh, the scope in terms of timing. You may recall that the, the, the TPD obliges us to fix a date. It's when the people left because of a armed conflict. The armed conflict started off the 24th of February, so we had to include that date in the Council implementing decision, which triggered the, 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 the directive. Of course, that immediately raises question about those people who may have seen the war coming and went, uh, went earlier to the Union or who were already in the Union as students or for work or for holidays. Uh, and there are quite a few member states, I think, it, when it comes to the extension, most of them said, OK, uh, we uh, will uh, use another cutoff date. We will be uh, more generous when it comes to those who were already in our territory uh, before the 20th of February and who obviously cannot go back. That was uh, 60 seconds, I think, uh, or 70, but not more. This was great. Thank you so much, uh, Cecilia, and thanks again for uh, for having joined us. Uh, Philip, we have about uh, six minutes or so to 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 clarify a, a couple of questions, which I try to regroup um, 
under the heading finance under the heading finance a big question of course is repower is it enough uh repower you is it enough as a plan to notably ramp up renewable power um and get all the grid interconnections that we need um i i, I try to subsume sort of different questions into one um can you can you say more about repower you and its possible shortfalls because that might be an interesting thing to uh tackle from the parliament perspective um a difficult question to answer but i still try to uh, keep it short i think if the the 300 billion the envelope i mentioned earlier was actually new money that could now incentivize investments in member states um this could be a big step towards where we need to be but um, I think there's a bit of a lack of appetite in the member states to actually use that money because it would uh, mean to take it away from other um, you know, the investments that they had planned already. Um, and so I think one feasible way forward, or it's difficult, but I think still feasible, would be to increase the European financing for Repower EU. At the moment, as I mentioned earlier, it's only 20 billion to uh, which would come from the market stability reserve for reasons I don't want to get into, that's probably not a good idea. But I think overall pushing to finance Repower EU with actual European additional new money uh, would go a long way to get us there. And probably the 300 billion are not enough, but uh, there are, that's a sizable amount and would be definitely a, a much bigger step in the right direction than with the current financial framework, the financial envelope. So you're saying we need to talk about money uh, and we need to talk about own resources, I presume, which was uh, something that um, uh, is probably going beyond the scope of uh, um, uh, of this session here. But uh, if I if I interpret you uh, 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 correctly uh, and you're pointing out, of course, that most of repower money is a loans and B members had plans with those loans. If they had any plans, they might have projected uh, uh, and budgeted this money before before the repower energy related and energy security related um, uh, objectives uh, were put on the table. Um, is, is, that a, is that a fair way of, of, of putting it? Yes, absolutely. And I mean, there's still a lot of loans that were untapped, so that weren't uh, uh, used by the member states. And now the commission proposed that member states should uh, make use of, of the loan part of the RF facility. Um, but uh, for complicated reasons, I think member states had no interest in, uh, to do this um, the first time around, and it's uh, it's not so clear whether they would have an interest to do it now. And so the, we... the incentive, of course, to use loans is much lower than using grants. And I think this, if if grants were being put on the table, then what I mentioned earlier to steer that money towards actual climate beneficial objectives would be much easier. I think that's something that uh, uh, will be discussed uh, in this house um, in the in the upcoming months and needs to be and needs to be discussed and we will hopefully soon get the figures about the loan uptake um, in the in the RF um, uh, uh, envelope. Um, we don't have time and uh, I think you know policy is so much in flux uh, to go into the question over the uh, energy market design so I suggest we skip that because. Uh, most of uh, uh, the audience will know that there is an energy ministerial uh, energy council coming up uh, an announcement by uh, Mrs. von der Leyen today. Uh, I think it's uh, both too soon um, as well as too complicated uh, to go into uh, into this today, but uh, we'll uh, we at EPRS, we will set up I'm sure uh, more events in the future uh, tackling tackling the energy part. Uh, in in greater detail, but um, uh, Philip, can you can you just um, as a last point, maybe go a little bit deeper on the climate effect or the effects on the EU climate policy? Your main uh, message was we need to al align uh, our decisions on energy policy with our long term perspectives. So we need to talk about the the linkage uh, between the two. Um, can you say more about this, what this means for the Fit for 55? Uh, is it a problem if member states now fire up coal power stations, which they either kept in reserve or had deconnected uh, 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 earlier? Um, sure. I think, uh, you know, taking a step back when the war uh, broke out, I was, of course, devastated. But uh, when it came to climate, I had a, a small hope that this could actually be harnessed um, the, the energy situation uh, to accelerate um, 
the green transition. And I think this view is also taken in repower EU. Um, but unfortunately, what we're seeing is that national uh, uh, capitals aren't prescribing to that view, and they are spending probably too much uh, on on fossil fuels. And uh, I mean, it's it's a difficult spot there. And of course, given the electricity scarcity, um, I think it is necessary to fire up uh, coal generating uh, plants. Um, but yes, that uh, I mean, to a certain extent, coal is covered by the emission trading system, and so overall emissions are capped. Um, but still, I think, um, unfortunately, climate is taking a bit of a backseat at the moment. But, and I think it's important to remind politicians and everyone involved in the policy making process uh, that you know, the best way to deal with our energy shortage, which uh, will not just uh, occur this winter, but also in the next winter and probably the years afterwards, is to accelerate the green transition. And I think that's something that's happening not to a sufficient degree at the moment. Thank you, Philip, and thanks again for giving the figure on the need to further reduce energy consumption. 15% agreed demand reduction and 7% was the figure you gave. Uh, and I think that is in the short, in the very short term, uh, a, a key thing. Uh, thank you, Philip, uh, for joining us. Um, and um, I have a, a couple of questions to Anna uh, Caprile on uh, food security um, in the last uh, five minutes, uh, mainly on the on the maritime uh, mission. Can you can you sort of say a little bit more on where we are in terms of uh, moving uh, grain out by ships. Is there anything one can say in how far is that even possible to monitor? It, it probably is very difficult uh, in terms of uh, shipping. Uh, or can you give any sort of um, estimate um, of this? Um, and uh, especially also on Russian shipping. Uh, that's a question um, I got. Do we need an international maritime mission, or is this even uh, has this even been uh, discussed? Can you say uh, any more on shipping, but only very briefly though, because we do have uh, four minutes left. Yeah, and and I see also some uh, some questions uh, about the the solidarity lanes, um, and also how to capitalize these actions in terms of uh, EU uh, PR. Um, thinking about the elections in 2024. Um, I think all is a little bit related. Um, your question was, I suppose, um, um, uh, in, in regarding the Black Sea uh, Grain Initiative. And actually, the, the information is quite transparent, as much uh, as it can be. And you can find in the Joint um, Implementation Center or if I say correctly, sorry, the, um, the Joint Coordination Center based in Istanbul and composed by representatives of Turkey, um, Russia, Ukraine and the, and the UN. Um, they, they are quite transparent about the, the dates uh, the ships uh, leave uh, the, the uh, Ukrainian ports, the estimated arrival and um, and uh, the, the, the date of arrival and the contents. Um, so that's quite um, that's quite uh, that's quite transparent, and I think the monitoring um, and the and the, um, the the monitoring has been quite su successful for for the moment. Uh, regarding the EU solidarity lanes, and that was the question from uh, one of the of the audience saying that um, they are not effectively reaching third countries, and that is true. And I mentioned that in my in my in my presentation, and the reason is that. Um, uh, what what can be done by by an organization like the European Union is to empty Ukrainian silos. One, the ship, the 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 containers, um, which are much smaller, um, are in the EU uh, soil. Um, the whole thing is taken by market operators. So, uh, I mean, as far as food is treated as any other um, commodity. Um, and uh, much less regulated actually than uh, energy or water, um, we are in the hands of market operators. So we need a seller, but we need a buyer. The final product, the final price of that, um, uh, those um, uh, containers was not interesting for many countries uh, because it was too costly. So um, 
And that cannot be solved only by the European Union and certainly not through the European solidarity lines. What has been done in parallel is to try to help the countries that were under pressure because of food uh, prices to facilitate the import. And this has been done in several fora. So I think we are talking about um, a complex issue that, that cannot be solved just by trucks or by transfer from trains to trucks. And then um, there was a question about the objectives of the Black Sea. How much is expected to be shipped? I think the overall objective is 20 million and the, and the, 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 the target is 5 million per month. This is considered ambitious, but uh, realistic. And how can we capitalize better? Well, we have room for improvement. And just to, to, to illustrate, um, it was very easy to obtain the, the data regarding the Black Sea Grain Initiative. And it was almost impossible to have um, um, a global figure of the EU solidarity lines, um, how much grain has been unblocked so far. So I think that also is an effort that we can help to publicize much better the, the, the success. I stop there. You've stopped there at the right moment, I dare say, because it's exactly 3 p.m. I would have loved to listen longer to you, but I'm afraid we'll have to uh, call it a day because it's 3 p.m. and colleagues will have to move on to different meetings, uh, which are resuming uh, over there in the ASP building. Uh, eighth, uh, very warm thanks in particular to Cecilia and Philip who joined us as outside uh, speakers. Uh, thank you, Susanna. Uh, thank you, Anna. And thank you to everyone who is and has been uh, listening and viewing. We will continue the series um, uh, in the future. Uh, thanks and uh, have a good day. Bye, everyone.